Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry present the Cavalcade of America, dedicated to those men and women in every walk of life who have shaped the destiny of America in the past and to the youth of today who will shape the destiny of America in the future. Tom Paine, a man, an idea, a pen. It was that brilliant pamphleteer of 18th century America whose conception of the dignity and freedom of mankind knew no territorial boundaries, who gave a voice to a young America groping toward a realization of the ideal of freedom. With the well-known radio actor Frank Reddick in the title role, the Cavalcade of America presents the story of Tom Paine. London, the year 1774. Late one afternoon at the Cheshire Cheese, two men are talking. The older, England's great 18th century poet and dramatist, Oliver Goldsmith. The younger, a man of medium height with brilliant, piercing eyes, Tom Paine. You say you were visiting the Houses of Parliament this morning, Mr. Paine? Yes. Yes, I go as often as I can, Dr. Goldsmith. Well, at the same time, I find it a stimulating and... Aggravating experience. <laughs> yes, I know, sir. The current of ideas, the free expression of convictions. I always find it a vital evidence of freedom, evidence of freedom. It's not enough. Freedom should be made a fact. It should be lived. Any sensible man in London today would agree with you on that score, Mr. Payne. Dr. Goldsmith, on such an elusive topic as freedom, it would be difficult to find many persons who would understand or agree that the principle of freedom could be worked out as a practical philosophy in government. But Payne, England, believes in freedom. We've had a glorious tradition of liberty. Take England in the 13th century, when the rest of Europe was sunk in wholesale despotism. We gave the world England's first great triumph over arbitrary power. Yes, I know. Magna Carta. And then, of course, there's the long struggle of Parliament against the continual exercise of ruthless power. And that struggle culminated in England's Bill of Rights in 1688. In times like these, Mr. Payne, it's reassuring to recall the contributions of England toward the liberation of mankind. It's a precious thing, liberty. It's one thing to achieve it, it's another to hold it. And thus free men are constantly alert. Before they know it, they've lost these rights. Liberty is a responsibility. Quite true, Mr. Payne. Freedom of watchword should be eternal vigilance. And there are men today diverting their efforts to that end. Dr. French, for example, have you met him? Oh, yes, yes. We had some very interesting discussions along those lines. Speaking of Dr. Franklin, sir, we all know why he's in London. Yes, America. We know, as he knows, that the conception of liberty is fundamental among our peoples, and that conception must be preserved against whatever threats may be launched today. And yet, Dr. Goldsmith, how does our government answer the legitimate petitions and protests of the colonies against unreasonable taxation? That, Mr. Payne, is the tragedy of our era. Ah, it hardly proves an assertion that we stand for freedom and the kindred rights of the people with cause for grievance. Imagine how an Englishman like myself feels knowing Dr. Franklin and calling on him. You must remember the men in power, Mr. Payne. They're a handful, but they control Parliament regardless of popular feeling. They're not England. Who would you say is our greatest statesman today? I should say that Burke was. Edmund Burke. So should I. Uh, yesterday, several of us were sitting right here at this very table. Garrick, Boswell, and Dr. Johnson. Edmund Burke was here, too. Now, there's a man who knows the public opinion in England. Naturally would. The seat in Parliament. Burke does, but many do not. And Burke said that the way a handful of officials are treating America is absolutely deplorable and inconsistent with the majority feeling throughout England... I personally know other statesmen who feel the same way. Then why can't this stony-hearted treatment of the colonies stop? I hope it will before it's too late. Burke and the men of his stature in Parliament regard it as a tragic affront to the idea of freedom that really unites England with America. And he's right. That is Burke's unfailing virtue. He said we might lose America as a consequence because of the error and folly of a few myopic scapegoats in Whitehall. But that between our peoples there will be an understanding, a bond of freedom that will never be broken. 
come whatever challenges there might be in the future. Well, Dr. Goldsmith, the time has come. Englishmen and Americans believe in freedom. Now it's up to our generation to perpetuate it, to make it work in the world, not only for our time, but for all time. Amen to that, Mr. Payne. Uh, another pot of coffee? Oh, no, no, thank you, Dr. Goldsmith. It's dark already. I must be getting back to my lodgings. Good night, sir. Good night. You, Mr. Strumble. And who did you think it would be on a day like this? Mr. Payne, I've come for the rent. And I take cash, not promise. Oh, I'm a man without promise, Mr. Strumble. And with precious little cash into the bargain. Do I get my rent, Mr. Payne? Oh, oh, you get your rent. Here. Here's a shilling that was to feed me. Here's one that was to clothe me. And here's one I'd put aside against just such a rainy day as this. May I come in, Mr. Payne? Oh, Dr. Franklin. I find your stairs quite tall and my breath quite short. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I'm sorry, too, you've come on me while... While you're paying your rent, I should say, from the look of your companion. What sort of joke is that, sir? No joke at all, my good mistress. It's a tribute to the virtue that's writ on your every line. Well, I have only this to say to you, sir. Good night. <laughs> well, it's a long time since you've been to see me, Mr. Payne. I've missed your good talk and your quick mind. Oh, you're very kind, Doctor. But I've observed a hungry man makes a poor guest. Mm -hmm. A hungry man flatters his host or his cook. Dr. Franklin, you've been in England for some time. May I ask if you're entirely satisfied with the way things are going? No, I'm not. You see, a crisis is on the wing. Mr. Payne, what are your plans? Well, well, I'm planning on staying alive, Dr. Franklin, but for the life of me, I couldn't tell you how. Have you thought of using your pen? The other day, Dr. Goldsmith showed me a copy of a petition you wrote to Parliament. It would be a sinful waste if the force and clarity that went into it were allowed to go rusty through disuse. Dr. Goldsmith and I were talking about freedom this afternoon. How deeply it's needed in the world. Mr. Payne, why don't you go to America? Well, the thoughts never crossed my mind. Well, it is now, Mr. Payne. We in America are seeking the kind of freedom you mean. We need a voice to crystallize that feeling. America is a new world, and it wants new ideas. You're needed there. Needed as much as freedom is. Mr. Payne, you'll be heard in America. Will this table do, Mr. Colvin? Yes, fine, thank you. Oh, good day, Mr. Scarsby. Good day, gentlemen. Mr. Payne, how do you like our fine Philadelphia spring? Not keeping you from your work on the magazine? No, indeed. Just a little hungry for supper. Not too early, are we? Oh, you sit right down here by the window and I'll have Meg fetch it. Thank you. Meg! Meg! Yes, ma'am? Quick, girl, some of that mutton and the pudding for the gentleman. Very well, ma'am. Oh, thank you, mistress. Well, I see you have quite a few guests here today. Yes, yes, all talking about the same thing. I see what happens up in Boston is their own affair. The way they're talking, you think Philadelphia was right across a field from it. Well, we can't stand for unjust oppression. That's fundamental, Mr. Well, myself, I'm no Tory, but I say as my mother did before me. I can't stand for things turned topsy-turvy. Why can't we keep on as we are? I serving you and other gentlemen the best ale in Philadelphia, and all of us royal subjects of his majesty. You hear that, Coleman? Yes. That's the stagecoach from New York, isn't it? Aye, it comes from Boston, too. They'll be bringing news. Aye. Let's go outside and see for ourselves, Cousin. You're such a good gentleman. The maid just about has it ready. Now you've just come. Oh, you keep it warm. Container. We'll be right back. Oh, driver. Have you any news? I have indeed, sir. The redcoats fired on the men in Lexington and marched to Concord. The countryside's turned out in arms. 
Why does some fool always have to fire a musket at the wrong time? Perhaps there's still a chance of reconciliation with the crowd. Oh, crime. not now, Corbin. I thought there was once. Not after this affair at Lexington. From here on, there's no telling what will happen. But I know this. Freedom will take root in America. It's the cause of God and humanity. It's common sense. Plain common sense. Come on. Let's go back to the office. I want to write. Mr. Payne, wait. Wait. Here's the gentleman's supper. I'll take it back, Meg. I guess Mr. Payne and his friends are set. Maybe they're not hungry anymore. Well, I'll put it down. I'm hungry enough myself. Thank the stars for simple pleasures, eh, Meg? Uh, yes, ma'am. You always know what's best, ma'am. Excuse me, General Washington. If you are occupied. No, Lieutenant. I've just finished reading a pamphlet by Thomas Paine, Philadelphia. Indeed, sir? Well, sir, here are the orders of the day. Oh, yes, of course. Have you by any chance seen Mr. Payne's pamphlet yet, Lieutenant? Why, no, sir, I have not. What is it? It's a pamphlet called Common Sense, Lieutenant. And it is plain common sense. It deserves to be read by every corporal's guard in the Continental Army. And if necessary, I'll issue an order to that effect. Yes, sir. I wish and hope every man, woman, and child from New Hampshire to Georgia will read this pamphlet. It's the best kind of common sense. The sun never shone on a cause of greater worth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Ye that oppose terror stand forth. You're a brigade, a, a, a stranger. Oh, America, receive the fugitive and prepare an asylum for mankind. Now is the seed time of continental union. Now is the time for faith and honor. Now is the time for freedom. Now is the time for independence. Independence. Off with the yoke. Independence. We are in the days of hell. self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these men, Mr. Jefferson! Mr. Jefferson! Yes? Oh, good day, Mr. Payne. Congratulations, Mr. Jefferson. Thank you. Well, we've bravely declared independence. Yes. Now we must make it a fact. Oh, we must. I have a carriage, sir, if you'd care to ride to your lodgings. Well, well, thank you very much. I I am a little tired. Then this way, sir. Good. After you, sir. Thank you. All right, Sam. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Get up. Now, these people on the streets, Mr. Payne... Do you think they know what independence really means? That it means responsibility as well as liberty? Oh, they will, sir. After reading your declaration, you can be proud of it. You have as good a better right to be proud yourself. Your pamphlet, Common Sense, prepared the way. It made people ready to declare their freedom. But I'm sure of one thing, Mr. Payne. What's that, Mr. Jefferson? Once given freedom, people must fight to keep it. And they must be reminded constantly of the blessings of their liberty, or it's lost. America is a young country, Mr. Jefferson. With it the hope and courage of youth. 
We've the strength, and now we have the will for freedom. Despotism is the curse of mankind, and now we have the chance to destroy it for all time in the United States. The United States. That was your phrase, too, Mr. Payne. We need men like you to express... I hope you'll continue to write. Oh, that can wait, Mr. Jefferson. When the need arises, I'll write again. As you say, we, we must all fight to keep our liberty. Right now, we need soldiers. We've had enough talking and writing for a while. Now I've had a chance to become General Washington's adjutant. I'm going to enlist, sir. Halt. Who goes there? A friend. Advance, friend, and be recognized. Thomas Payne, volunteer adjutant to General Green, attached to General Washington's staff, returning to duty. In this cold and on Christmas Eve, you must be daft. Nay, Sentry. Too many others are deserting already. Where'd we be if we all left? Well, mayhap we'd be warm and cozy, like them Hessian pigs crossed the river in Trenton. I wouldn't trade places with them. Would you? Mayhap you're not as cold and hungry as me, Ed. We're all cold and hungry and ragged, Sentry. But if we've lost heart, we've lost all. Well, I ain't telling you to desert, Adjutant. But if you did, I wouldn't blame you any more than the others. A warm home's the best place to be on a night like this. Nor do I blame you, Sentry, for thinking of home. But it is our very home. Your home and mine. That we're fighting for. And our right to enjoy them as free-born Americans. Our well, liberty's all right for them as believes it. With my belly empty, I ain't sure. But you must believe it, Sentry. Else why do you stand here? Uh, that's what I've been asking myself. You must believe it. You shall, Sentry. Good night. God bless your Christmas. Thank you, Adjutant. But I ain't saying how much more we can stand. You, General Washington. I saw your fire, Adjutant. Thought you were writing. We might at least provide you a desk instead of a drum to write on. And out of the cold, too. Well, the drum was handy, General, and I wanted to feel the cold. Like the sentry felt it. The sentry who challenged me a little while ago. I wanted to feel it freeze the marrow of my bones and see how we can keep it from chilling his heart. If this pamphlet is like your others, Adjutant, it will give our army new heart and courage, if anything can. What did this sentry say? Oh, it was cold, hungry, and ragged, like all the rest. He wasn't sure just how much longer he could last. I know. What can we do, Adjutant? Many times everything seemed as hopeless to me as it does to them. If these continue, I'll be a general without an army. The worst of it is, sir, that the poor fellows have lost hope in liberty. Yes. I wonder if there's a victory left in... What do you call this new pamphlet? The crisis. The crisis. We have a crisis indeed. Do you mind if I see it? No, General. Although it's not quite finished. Here it is, sir. Thank you, Adjutant. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Liberty's all right for them that believes it. I ain't sure how much more we can stand. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. For he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. These liberties are all right for them that believe it. I ain't sure how much more we can stand. 
journey like hell is not easily conquered. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. By perseverance and fortitude, we have the prospect of a glorious issue. By cowardice and submission, the sad voice of a ravaged country, a depopulated city, habitations without safety and slavery without hope. It is all right for them as believers. I am sure how much more we can stand. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, where nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and country, alarmed at one common danger, come forth to meet and to repulse. October 19th, 1781. <laughs> Gentlemen, one more cup before we go out to the parade ground. To our glorious victory. Uh, just a moment, Colonel Hamilton. To General Washington, our commander. And in eternal memory of this day here at Yorktown. A toast to General Washington. Thank you, Marquis de Lafayette. Thank you. May I call your attention to the music? Perhaps you and France are not acquainted with the brave old tune, The World Turned Upside Down. Well, it certainly turned our world right side up. <laughs> <laughs> Significant they should be playing that today. We've done more than defeat my Lord Cornwallis, gentlemen. The crisis is over. We've won our cause. And now we have our freedom. Before this, we had nothing we could call our own. Now we're no longer dependent and disunited, but the independent and united states of America. Well, here's the last step, sir. Here's my room. After you, Dr. Franklin. Thank you. Sit down, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, my breath still comes short when I think of your other staircase. Every time you climb stairs to see me, something happens, Doctor. Yes, I know, Tom. In London, it meant you're coming here to the new world. And now here you're leaving us. Go back to the old. Why? I must, Dr. Franklin. But the war is over. We've won. Why not enjoy the fruits of your labor? No. My usefulness is here is over. Now Europe needs someone to speak out against tyranny and for freedom. Tom, have you forgotten that it's not easy in Europe to speak at all? You can't stifle an idea, Dr. Franklin. The flame of liberty lighted in America will never be snuffed out. I mean in Europe. America may be a crude land, Tom, but I couldn't live happily anywhere else. Dr. Franklin, I think I would be unhappy here. Unhappy? No, Tom. Think of the freedom... Where liberty is, there is my country. And where liberty is not, there is my country. All his life, Tom Paine was a champion of the rights and freedom of humanity everywhere. And so he will be remembered by the world. But because it was America that gave him his first call, and because he inspired in America the will to be free, Tom Paine takes an honored place in the cavalcade of America. Thank you, Frank Reddick. 
And now the cavalcade of America's historian, Dr. Frank Monahan of Yale University. Next week, Cavalcade presents the story of Nancy Hanks, the mother of Abraham Lincoln. I think we will all agree that Abraham Lincoln was, in the exact meaning of the word, a great man. What are the things that make men great? Is it heredity or environment or circumstance? Certainly the mother of Lincoln exercised a decisive influence upon him. Nancy Hanks knew the hardships of the frontier, but in the midst of scrubbing and spinning and mending, she kept her eyes lifted to the horizon and beyond. She lived close to the earth and the smell of wild, earthy things. She took certain comfort in the promise of the future. She had no formal education, and her constant advice to her son was, Abe, you go to school now and learn all you can. Although Nancy Hanks could not sign her own name, she made a significant mark in American history because she was the inspiration of Abraham Lincoln. Our story of Nancy Hanks next week, the Cavalcade of America presents in the title role the well-known radio actress Agnes Moorhead. The orchestra and the original musical effects on the Cavalcade of America are under the direction of Don Voorhees. This is Basil Rysdale saying good night and best wishes from DuPont. Music